Adam and Eve lived a peaceful life in the Garden of Eden. They were never absent from food, the thought of fighting to stay alive never crossed their minds, and their fingers had never gone numb from the cold, they had never seen the crimson red of blood. So peaceful was their life that they walked side by side with snakes, never flinching, not worried about the dangers they might pose. It was the Gnostic Christians who did not believe this world was paradise, they believed it was a prison. Constructed by Yao the Baeth, the prideful, blind god who kept mankind asleep in his ignorance. The Gnostics thought the world was made to be restrictive and distracting, drawing man's energy away from divine consciousness, slowing its vibration to resonate with the lowly consciousness of Yao the Baeth. And it was the snake who offered us the fruit, a predator. This woke us up, and it is predators who transform the minds of human beings, and it was through the serpents in the forest that a large amount of evolutionary pressure was applied to us. Eating the fruits granted Adam and Eve the knowledge of good and evil, which also presented them with freedom. Now man was free to find what the Gnostics believed to be completion, Gnosis. In Eden, Adam and Eve were naive and childlike. They were untroubled, but they did not have the same awareness of the world as the angels. The Archons, servants of Yao the Baeth, were shadowy, serpentine figures enlisted to enslave man through darkness, sucking onto his soul like a leech and diverting his gaze into the abyss, directing his attention into nothingness, away from the high lights of civilization, ecstatic art, theology, health, virtue. True virtue is not still. It burns like a fire and burns inside of you like a flame. It wants to light up the world and illumine it. The virtuous and strong man wants to make the world his domain. He does not want to shy away from it. This is why the Gnostics wanted to be free and aware, not asleep in ignorance. The Archons can be seen in a similar way to the temptation of sin that comes from a more Christian thought. They mingle with you seductive and secret. They want you to bind with them and create things that are ghastly and far away from God. Things that are an abomination to the light from above. Things that begin to slow the vibration of human consciousness, sapping libido, weakening faith. And many people will hear this and hear a man rambling about these strange texts and think, are you a lunatic? What do you mean that the world is full of these snake creatures sleeping with human beings and sucking their souls into the darkness? This is just not the world, and this is so far from what I experience day to day. But the people who see these stories in this way fail to see how these stories are important and relevant to their own lives. They fail to see how the pattern of this strange myth reproduces itself everywhere. The film The Matrix is almost a perfect replica of this myth. Mankind in The Matrix is a battery capable of higher consciousness, but trapped by these inorganic, ungodly rulers. People walk asleep inside a false reality blissfully like Adam and Eve, but they do not awaken to the truth. They have little strife that is actually fruitful, and they remain unfree. And again, the voice of the sleepwalkers calls out, what do you mean people walk inside a false reality? I am here and I see the world around me and this is what is real. I know what is real because I feel it. But I'll explain the extent to which we should take this idea of Archons more seriously. Notice how the idea of the Matrix is being spoken of by people like Andrew Tate at the moment. The idea of people being plugged into some sort of false reality. The reason for this and why it's so popular is that we grow up and adopt certain beliefs and ideas and we take them as an absolute certainty and sometimes we cannot even comprehend people who do not share these beliefs without conceptualizing them as either some form of monster or some form of enemy. Perhaps you grew up believing that the idea of God was ridiculous and saw it as basically a bunch of adults believing in some strange fairy tale that you grew out of immediately. And this gives you a feeling of superiority. And you don't recognize that most of these believers are thinking of something completely different when you say the word God and they do. Something that has spoken to them and been with them privately 
and move their life in a secure, sober and positive direction. Perhaps you were taught at a young age that competition is some sort of negative and it would be best if everyone could get along and no one could lose and be left out. Maybe you even believe it is wrong to desire to win. A few years later, of course, perhaps you realise that competition can be healthy or even necessary and that your instinct to win can actually transform the world into something beautiful and that you and other people can try their best and lose in a dignified way, respecting those who have managed to succeed even further than you. Maybe you have gone your whole life without really questioning the complexity of what money is and the fiscal system, without realising that money is more or less arbitrary and exists largely as a psychological entity and nothing else. Money passes hands and certain people receive staple foods and more time in their residence, whereas others, using the situation to their advantage, get mansions and super yachts. And this is all because these things are given to them by other people. This is because people trust the system at large and distribute resource and influence within it. We hold on to our money as though it is real, when its true nature is constantly in flux in ways that we don't see. The fear of death limits the minds of almost all humans, and the food we eat at these current times saps our health and vitality. Our habits lead us to forget what human beings are capable of, because we are neutered and we shine dimly. Some of our ancestors were so in tune with the world, they could take down lions. And what the Gnostics were trying to get at was that the world is full of these forces that blind us and trap us and stop us from realising a higher consciousness and higher purposes. And it was the point of these Gnostics that from their origin, these forces were animate and alive, secretly speaking through the world. And here again the sleepwalkers will drift off and call these ideas crazy because it is easier to not take these scriptures seriously. But the mystics who believed in this stuff were coming to terms with something that, at least as a symbol, is very, very real. Because you can actually see the will of these forces being brought to life in certain people. People like the resentful man. The resentful man becomes cynical, bitter and malicious. But at the same time this happens, interestingly, they lose more and more of their own self-control. The actions of others have more of an effect on them and their ego. They quickly become neurotic, driven by responsiveness, and cannot really recognise what they truly need to do to escape their cesspit of bitterness. You might say that this person lacks higher thinking and clarity. They are slaves to their instincts and are controlled by these more basic and material mechanisms of the body. They are more distressed when their gut signals to their brain that they are hungry or in pain. And all of this factors into why they do not succeed in life and why they want to take out their revenge on the world. These people have either adopted a truly materialistic worldview or are at the whim of matter and its dictums and certain systems of the material world. And the Gnostics are trying to figure out what the voice of this matter that is imprisoning man and causing him to commit these crazy atrocious actions is. And maybe this is where the Gnostics go wrong, because they shun the material world, whereas a typical Christian might rather look at the material world as a sort of spiritual bride, but the Gnostics still have a very good point to be acknowledged. As soon as our consciousness cannot rise above the material world and its systems and is subordinate to it, you can see the will of Yao the Beoth and the Archons speaking through that person more and more. You even see some of the elites who partake in these systems having these rituals, burning effigies of these idols and gods, worshipping these strange figures and bringing about systems of chaos and degeneracy. That should make you think. Who is really bringing about their will in the world? Is it the human beings in power, or the symbols and characters of the unconscious that they worship and serve? Mythology is a quest to explain reality at the deepest level. It extends far beyond what our rational minds tend to be able to articulate. But, moving on, 
The Gnostic scriptures describe these archons as powerless, completely and utterly. Their powers are restricted by a figure of truth who came in the last days, Christ, preventing the archons from controlling fate. Christ as an incarnation of the word unifies the cosmos. The archons become powerless and tragic actors since their mission ultimately fails. While the archons are powerless, man contains within himself the spirit of the All, the Gnostic God, which is the true power of the cosmos. Mankind plays a part in the creation of reality. The Archons, seeing this, exploit mankind by lowering his consciousness and creating abominations conjoined with him. The Gnostics speak of these Archons attempting to defile Eve sexually, without realising that Eve has fled from them and that they are mingling with a shadowy image of her. It is no wonder the Gnostics were persecuted for telling such stories. Eve is the mother of mankind. She is responsible for bringing the future generations into existence and shaping them into what they are. It was Eve who gave the apple to Adam which woke him from his ignorance. This can be seen as a parallel to the rejection men experienced at an early age from women. Men quickly realised that they must become something worthy of existing into the next generations, and man's form is therefore cultivated by women. The Archons wish to mate with Eve and entangle themselves with mankind, for mankind has spirit from that which is above. Yao de Baeth wishes to rule over man to prove himself the powerful god. He therefore wishes to make man like himself, an abomination devoid of the true freedom that they were gifted. This is the same as the spirit of arrogance in those who think themselves above any higher power. They give up higher aims and the voice of the Archons begins to speak through them again. They become decrepit, and this is exactly what happens when people perversely seek to bring new things into existence. The perverse unite with Eve in the imagination, tricking themselves into feelings of power and believing that they are generating mankind anew. They are instead are mingling with her image. Their satisfaction is fruitless and their desires only serve themselves. Think of porn as an example. Even when those who have abandoned connection to what is above find some success in the world, the legacies they leave are not their own. They have lost their individuality by serving desires that they do not truly control, and their actions do not move mankind forwards in a new direction. They only poison. Now how does all of this relate to Friedrich Nietzsche? Nietzsche relentlessly criticised religions for their ascetic nature. Nietzsche wanted you to embrace the voice of your soul, to dance with your desires and to drink in every bittersweet moment of life. And Nietzsche would likely have had some very harsh words for the practices of the Gnostics, dedicating their lives to an obscure gnosis and seemingly being very ineffectual in the real world, living in secrecy and denial. This is antithetical, to a lot of ways life wishes to express itself. Nietzsche calls you to listen to the voice of the soul and to the voice of your passions. And this becomes something many people fear about Nietzsche's philosophy. Nietzsche does not want you to reject that which is from within. He believes that the highest forms our species has ever produced are obliged to express their will to power. And this makes most of us very concerned about what direction this would lead. What if these overmen Nietzsche wishes to create care little for us and doom us to poverty and slavery? If such a man came about and was powerful and unrestrained, who did not submit himself to a higher power, perhaps again we would see the voice of Yao de Baeth begin to echo through him, and the Gnostic myth would turn frighteningly real. And this turns many away from Nietzsche's thoughts, perhaps even away from some genuine virtuous instincts he promotes too. But what these people lack, for better or worse, is Nietzsche's faith in the overman, a being free from the spirit of gravity, Promethean in his quest to adorn new values. Nietzsche believes this being will inevitably lead mankind towards the light, and his goal therefore remains subordinate to something higher. Nietzsche hopes mankind can roar defiantly in the face of any shadowy ruler that wishes the world to be our prison, and he hopes that we can claim the world as our own. But the Gnostics are doubtful 
that this is where true salvation will lie for us. They believe that the world will run out of space or simply swallow us, and this will leave us entangled with the Archons. Only through an assimilation of knowledge will we be free. The Christians believe the world will be inherited by the meek, and the apocalypse draws closer day by day. All of these forces in these days are interacting with each other, and they are playing a part in the direction of the future that is rapidly approaching. Which way will your soul lead you?